Well, thank you, Andreas, and uh, welcome everybody that's joining in this uh, webinar on unmanned aircraft systems and animal agriculture. Uh, my name is Wayne Wolt. I'm at the University of Nebraska, and I've been working on a research and extension direction towards unmanned aircraft for about the last four years now. So today what I'd like to do is uh, just give a thank you. an overview of a diversity of potential applications of unmanned aircraft. There's, it's amazing what the possibilities are, and I think it's really only limited by our imagination. Um, I, it seems like every day I hear about a new idea, and I kind of think, well, that's really neat. Why didn't I think of that? Um, and then, uh, of course, we'll want to zero in a little bit here on agricultural opportunities and just a quick look at the idea of precision agriculture and then uh, bringing it a little closer to animal agriculture. And I'd like to look at animal agriculture from more of a generalized perspective. Um, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest and, and potential in these, but when you really get down to searching the literature and identifying uh, refereed uh, journal type of research, uh, it's a little bit thin at this point in time, and largely because it is such a uh, merging area of technology and opportunity. But I will uh, um, kind of take a little bit closer look at uh, some research on flight zone interference uh, when I get to that portion of the presentation. And then I'd like to just make a little bit of a, a announcement on uh, e-extension learning network on uh, unmanned aircraft systems in agriculture. We've been uh, running this program now for about a year there's a website, uh, learnuasag.org, and all of our uh, past webinars are archived on that website, uh, which has a tremendous amount of information, mainly on uh, row crop or cropping or specialty cropping types of uh, applications of unmanned aircraft in agriculture. Um, not much on uh, animal agriculture, so that's why this is quite an opportune interest to me to uh, explore this a little bit further. So in terms of potential applications, um, Andreas mentioned a few of them, and uh, I'll just kind of put up a list here. And, uh, you know, the Amazon uh, and uh, uh, package delivery sure does gather a lot of news, but there's um, hurricane and storm hunting kinds of applications. I haven't really met a pilot yet that's ready to fly into a booming thunderstorm. Uh, you know, take their plane in and just see what happens. Well, there are uh, uh, investigators that are flying unmanned aircraft into these kinds of environments with uh, multiple sensors on board to kind of determine what the, the dynamics are within a thunderstorm, to learn more about how they form, how they progress, and even, you know, what types of storms might be spinning off tornadoes, for example. Um, ocean currents, monitoring of ocean currents, and even iceberg melt rate uh, tie a little bit to um, climate and uh, you know, our dynamic climate that we have uh, in this globe. And um, there's some interesting research taking place there. Uh, mapping of terrain and features, we can see where that would tie right into agriculture, and we'll do that in a little bit. Protecting wildlife, especially endangered species in Africa. There are uh, the use of drones there to uh, monitor endangered species and, and keep an eye out for poachers. Um, transportation, and in transportation it's really wide open, but bridge inspection sure is gathering a lot of attention where you can take an unmanned aircraft down under a deck and, and look around and get in close and kind of see what's going on there. Um, energy, um, Andreas mentioned uh, power line pipeline inspection very much an aviation-oriented type of activity, and bringing unmanned aircraft in could be real help. Uh, wind turbine inspection, um, you know, when the blades are stopped, of course, to take a close look at blades, look for small cracks, micro cracks that might be developing, and uh, therefore you know, take a little bit earlier intervention before there's a catastrophic failure. Border protection, water resources, search and rescue, it, the list just goes on, emergency response, disaster recovery even after. But you have to be real careful in these last few, uh, search and rescue, emergency response, and disaster recovery, because a lot of times when these types of events take place, 
there will be uh, what are called TFRs, and Andreas mentioned those, uh, temporary flight restrictions. And those do apply to unmanned aircraft, so you have to be very careful and watch out. Um, we know we, we heard some news last summer about fire and fire response in California where the uh, there were TFRs in place, but the flyers of the unmanned aircraft didn't know it, weren't aware of it, and it put the pilots in jeopardy. And they actually uh, grounded their aircraft and said, we're not going up until we know that the airspace is safe for us. Let's shift a little bit now and focus on uh, agricultural applications. Um, and it's interesting because a number of studies have been conducted where these uh, uh, the purpose of the studies were to kind of crystal ball gaze forward, look ahead into the future, you know, kind of where's this all this uh, unmanned aircraft market heading? And it's estimated that agriculture will be around 70% of the market going forward. So it is projected to be the lion's share of unmanned aircraft. And it kind of makes sense because if you're managing large parcels of land or ranches or a large number of uh, livestock, why, if you can get that aerial view, that bird's eye view, that can be, in some cases, priceless in terms of the information that it delivers to help make better decisions. Um, within agriculture, we know there's R&D, research and development. That's what one of the things we're involved in, in the University of Nebraska. Um, we're, uh, we're flying regularly and have been now for a number of years in uh, research and development on uh, unmanned aircraft, again, primarily towards, in this case, uh, row crops. Um, specialty crop production, uh, definitely used in this case for um, uh, orchards, for example, uh, vineyards, where the, um, what I call the uh, crop uh, value density can be quite large, quite high, and uh, really pays to really closely manage those types of crops because of the value and the, and the density that, that you're looking at. Um, row crops mentioned that. Crop dusting is interesting. Um, you know, in, in the Midwest, Great Plains area, why when we think of crop dusters, we're looking at air tractors that have 600, 800 gallons of, uh, of, uh, uh, of material on board and that they can deliver. Um, that's an interesting concept for unmanned aircraft. I, I don't know how far that we are away from the FAA um, certifying unmanned aircraft approaches to actual crop dusting, but I mention it here because on a very limited basis, it can be uh, potentially quite powerful. We see in the lower right corner a uh, Yamaha R-Max, and those are uh, outfitted with uh, tanks on them, and they can deliver product. Um, they're fairly small, though. We have another picture of one here on the left. They're on the order of about, uh, oh gosh, about 10 foot long or so, and they fly autonomously. Um, but probably with crop dusting, the greater use right now of the small unmanned aircraft is for scouting, crop scouting, in order to plan and respond to needs of crops. And then, of course, livestock production, and whether it's a confined animal feeding operation or open range. Tremendous amount of possibilities in application in this area. We'll explore that a little bit more. Um, industry demand and market is, uh, again, um, there are consultants and companies that look at this to try to project where it's headed, and uh, the numbers are quite large. Um, there's a first bulleted item here. It's a little bit of an older study by the Department of Commerce, but projecting on the order of uh, annual uh, budgets or uh, impacts of $11 billion by 2020. Um, through the next uh, bulleted item down is a little bit uh, newer study, September 2015, uh, Congressional Research Service, which was uh, suggesting over the next 10 years uh, that production will rise from $4 billion annually to $14 billion annually. And of course, this ties into the, some of the topics that Andreas was mentioning about uh, design, about maintenance, um, and, and learning how to fly. A lot of opportunity in this area, and these, these numbers catch your attention for sure. So again, uh, now, um, continuing on with the look at agriculture, we know we have a grand challenge of 
for us. Uh, again, projections of population, nine billion uh, by the year 2050, and the associated uh, increase in food and fiber demand that this kind of increase in population where will generate is just going to be phenomenal and a tremendous challenge. Because in a sense, we're you know the question might be asked: Are we already operating at a at about a maximum potential? You know, the, the crops are being uh, uh, planted every year. They're they're grown. They're harvested. Um, we've used a lot of the land space. We've got water resources capabilities, but we have certain limits there. You know, the next question is: How are we going to do? How are we going to do more? How are we actually going to keep this growth potential going? And one potential area of opportunity is technology. And we know that GPS has had a tremendous impact on agriculture already. Just knowing where you are is a tremendously important uh, feature for production agriculture. Um, here we have a tractor with, with equipment on it and a, a guidance system in the tractor that will help uh, keep it on track and, and delivering the product uh, to the field if you're planting. And, uh, very efficient manner. And then we can go a step further once we know where we're at to precision agriculture. And again, in cropping world, um, we start to talk about maybe a yield monitor or a yield map that's generated from logging data during harvest to adding in some point samplings, maybe some soil nutrient information, some data analysis and th synthesis to a prescription map and then eventually to uh, actual deployment of that um, precision agriculture kind of uh, approach. Maybe we can get more production, more efficient production, with uh, less inputs in a precision agriculture approach to, to uh, crop and livestock production. Here at Nebraska, we've been focusing a little bit more on variable rate irrigation as a part of precision agriculture. We know that we have center pivot systems that can apply water at different locations, at different rates, at different times. Uh, the big question is, okay, we have the technology to do that, how do we decide? And we determined here at Nebraska we needed a new view. For us it was uh, unmanned aircraft and uh, ability to look over that field from an aerial perspective. But let's take a look at animal agriculture. This is really intriguing and um, has huge potential. I just I wasn't able to find a lot going on, at least published at this point in time. But there's still uh, kind of uh, popular literature information, um, you know, uh, reports in, uh, in some of the trade magazines, trade journals, and such that I was able to pull together here to at least give us thoughts of how we might move forward. And uh, I'll talk about each of these in a little more uh, detail going forward. But uh, there's herd, uh, adaptive range management, manure application management, stress management, disease detection, facility security, and, and emergency response. So in terms of herd management, um, yeah, well, livestock count would be nice at times, especially on a range setting. You know, what? How is there an error in inventory? that I would expect if I can get a good count on my uh, livestock. And um, if there is an error in inventory, what might be causing that? That could be an indication of an emerging problem. I'm not seeing what I would expect, and so I need to go out and investigate. Um, also in calving season, that's a very vulnerable time. And here we have an image that you can see there are some smaller uh, livestock there. and. Uh, you know, to see how they're doing, are they thriving, are there any of them in trouble? Um, with that vulnerable time and that edit information, uh, can you know, better decisions be made? Um, herding is uh, this is an interesting one here, and in this case, the uh, multi-rotor copters, something like Andrea showed, uh, something like a Phantom, uh, can be outfitted with a uh, first-person view type of setup, and we see a uh, picture here, upper left corner of a, an individual, and they have on these goggles. It looks kind of, sometimes looks a little bit funny, uh, but they're, they're wearing these goggles, and no, what those do is allow them to see the image from the aircraft as it's flying, and then with that capability to kind of come down in and, and uh, 
excite the livestock to get a, the livestock to move in a certain direction and affect kind of a herding kind of effort. Um, and this will tie in uh, to the research that I mentioned in a few slides uh, uh, yet to be uh, seen. Another, this is uh, some uh, published literature I came across by uh, Al Rango. Um, this is adaptive range management is where he's headed, where the idea is to take a look at range land with an aerial perspective delivered by unmanned aircraft in an efficient manner and um, get an idea of the biomass, how much uh, food stock is available and how that might be changing over time and over location in terms of helping to manage the uh, system in a little bit more efficient manner. He's, he's got a fair amount of uh, published literature on his work as uh, part of the Ag Agricultural Research Service. Um, another article, this was uh, out of uh, Progressive Dairyman, and this is the use of unmanned aircraft for manure management. Uh, this one was quite interesting. Uh, this uh, particular dairy operation is using unmanned aircraft for um, maybe, as he mentioned, employee training to give a different view, uh, field safety scouting to look for um, uh, potential uh, risk factors in a field uh, as part of the uh, manure application protocol, um, improved application methods and help with uh, um, finding, uh, you know, uh, ways that things can be done in a better way, and also marketing, getting that point of view that is very difficult to achieve otherwise and put those images out on their marketing materials. So this is kind of, I would call this kind of a low-hanging fruit type of application of unmanned aircraft. Very powerful, very intriguing and engaging, but you know, when I think of manure management, I also think of nutrient management and the use of unmanned aircraft to help with uh, nutrient management, land application, and um, that's certainly possible. Um, here's an interesting application. This is also uh, published uh, literature from uh, Schmalley in the uh, Field Robotics Journal. And in this case, it's uh, aerobiological sampling to determine a presence and movement of stressors and agricultural threat agents. And uh, here we have a uh, aircraft, this is a fixed wing type of unmanned aircraft, the other main type, there's fixed wing and then the multi-rotors. And this has little uh, kind of sticky sample collectors on the leading edge of the wing. And then these are flown across uh, agricultural settings. They pick up uh, materials, agents for example, threat agents, and can be analyzed then to determine what might be present in that area. Um, Sentinel Monitoring, um, this company provides a uh, essentially a multi-rotor uh, type of unmanned aircraft. And by the way, the FAA does consider tethered unmanned aircraft to be aircraft. And in this case, there is a tether. I'll kind of draw the, your attention to this cable. Here's one here at night, and there's a cable. And so these things essentially have, well, they have a, a large amount of energy available to them. They can fly for hours or days or weeks on end I've been down, down the in order to uh, place the unmanned aircraft up in the air and uh, maintain a kind of a surveillance um, with uh, cameras that are mounted, whether they're night vision cameras or day vision matter. They can even be both in this case. There's a couple of, uh, of uh, lenses there that uh, keep an eye on things. That's another area of potential application. Um, thermal sensors and visual sensors combined, and this is out of our research farm here in uh, University of Nebraska. And here we have a, we overflew a greenhouse. This was in early December. Um, we can see the greenhouse here, and then here we have shadows, long shadows because of the low sun on the horizon. And then here's a thermal image where we, same day, same flight, um, where we see now the grid pattern of the greenhouse showing through, and then the cooler spots caused by the shadowing of the sun on that cooler uh, December day. So this kind of sensor possibility can come to play in livestock animal agriculture, 
And here we have a, uh, an image from John Nowatzki at uh, North Dakota State University. And um, they're experimenting with the use of uh, thermal signatures of livestock as an indicator of uh, possible presentation of disease. So uh, placing those thermal sensors, a FLIR, for example, forward-looking infrared sensor onto an unmanned aircraft could offer great potential to kind of see outliers, see uh, livestock that might be stressed either by disease or maybe because of heat. And uh, of course, then you're starting to maybe talk about flying at nighttime, which would require some special permissions from the FAA. So in terms of taking now animal agriculture in the same direction we took row crop agriculture in this direction of precision agriculture, uh, that's happening, it's occurring, and there's a great deal of research out there on the use of animal identification where you start to manage a herd on an individual basis, knowing information about each individual animal. Um, tremendously powerful kind of concept. There's also use of uh, estrus detection types of technologies to help bring efficiency to the uh, management of the herd, activity monitors. Again, now tying activity monitors to animal identification, start to really bring information together, um, sexed semen to kind of drive the herd direction that you want to go. And then robotics, another uh, type of technology that's entering into precision animal agriculture, especially in milking systems. Tremendous advances there that can uh, take, uh, uh, you know, and really automate the process and make it a lot more pleasant than perhaps when my grandfather used to milk the cow. And then we can add now to robotics the idea of unmanned aircraft systems, because really they are just a, a, uh, a robotic system that flies through the air. And I'd like to tie this type of robotic back to these kinds of potential opportunities where they can add to and complement animal identification estrus detection and activity monitors and add new dimensions, new additional layers of information that can help in more efficient management of the herd. Zeroing in on kind of an interesting project that I came across, and here I've always had a lot of questions from people when I'm doing extension programs on, uh, well, how sensitive are livestock to unmanned aircraft that might be flying around them? And I've always had to respond, well, I really don't know because I haven't seen any research on that. Sounds like an interesting exploration. And so I did some more digging and I did come across a uh, project at uh, Sam Houston State University by uh, Marcy Beverly and reported again in Progressive Dairyman. And what she did with some students was uh, set up animals in different types of settings and then flew unmanned aircraft, multi-rotor aircraft over them and kind of did measures on when they started to get uh, excited or uncomfortable, let's say. Started to you know, feel, let's say, a threat from that uh, overhead object. And so her initial results, and she did indicate these are initial, they're continuing the work to try to refine it further, uh, indicated a 15-foot high flight interference zone with uh, cows and with calves on pasture heifers on pasture and goats on pasture, and a 25-foot interference zone where you have cows in a dry lot, horses in round pens, and horses in an arena. So there is, it appears there's a difference in that uh, flight interference zone, and it may actually, this continues to be explored, tie into you know, the position of the unmanned aircraft relative to the animal. Is it approaching from the front, from the side, from the back? Um, number of variables there that come into play that might actually affect uh, even these numbers. And that could, I just wanted to tie that real briefly into herding. You know, I mean, if, if you're going to use these to herd with the first person view system, why uh, you're, you're probably going to want to get into that interference zone where the animals uh, take a notice and start to react to the object in the air. Anyway, her research then led to some initial measures of aircraft performance and greater understanding of unmanned aircraft to perform assigned missions in an animal agriculture setting. Very interesting. 
So real briefly then, uh, just to kind of tie in now a little bit closer to the technology of unmanned aircraft, this is the type of aircraft we're flying primarily at the uh, University of Nebraska. It's fixed wing. Here's a, uh, a ground control station with a tablet we use to program and give our flight plan. Here's a optical camera, RGB type camera. Very interesting. Doesn't look like your typical uh, Sony. And then here's a FLIR thermal infrared. Um, it's called a TAU-2, T-A-U number two uh, type of uh, infrared camera. And then when you're going to go out and do this kind of research or flights, you need to think about the dynamics of the interaction between the um, airframe itself and the sensor, what's its field of view, the altitude that you're flying at. We do fly below 400 feet, and as Andreas mentioned, AGL, above ground level. And uh, that gives us a certain field of view then that we use to help in planning the way we go about flying our unmanned aircraft. In this case, we might do a uh, uh, what's called a racetrack pattern. Here we have a certain width at which point that sensor is able to sense we fly from, in this case, maybe south to north with that given width. And then we turn the aircraft to the east, come back down the middle of the field, turn to the west. And what do we do here? We just turn a little bit early, and we get our overlap that we're looking for, and we continue that pattern all the way across the field. So if you wanted to image a, a ranching operation, for example, larger area, you might consider this kind of an approach uh, to uh, gather that imagery data that you might be after. So here's an example of a flight plan on the tablet. The uh, bird, the aircraft is noted here, and this is what we call our home point. That's our uh, home reference point. And if there's ever any problems with the communication between the aircraft and the ground control station, then after a period of seconds, and we can program that, it'll come back and just fly around the home point, stay there until we take over and resolve the problem. Um, here's a flight track then, taking the flight from the computer and putting it in Google Earth. And taking a look at you know, how the aircraft flew the mission that we were after. See the lines there. And then we, of course, aren't after just flying. We're after information. And here's, for example, taking imagery and stitching it together. Um, we're flying at a, a low enough altitude that we can't take a picture of the whole field at once. We have to take multiple pictures and uh, then reconstruct the total field image. Uh, software to do that. And then here's the other type of main technology. We have uh, this bird also. This is a multi-rotor uh, octocopter. And uh, this in, in this case, the Droidworks is the particular model we're flying. And these have, there's real advantages and disadvantages to each type. Uh, our fixed wing has longer flight duration of about an hour and a half flight duration. Um, these uh, multi-rotors tend to fly about 20 minutes or so. But they're easier to take off and land than a uh, fixed wing, where you do need a little more space, a little more landing space to, to get that bird in and get it landed. But there, you know, you, you work with both uh, advantages and disadvantages, and they each can bring strengths to the table. Um, this is the lab that I'm working in, the New Air Lab. And, uh, this is our, our research. I did, in this case, on uh, this um, image, wanted to draw your attention here, we put livestock in when we developed this uh, conceptual image because we did feel that there was a great opportunity with uh, animal agriculture, as well as cropping systems, as well as natural resources. So I would like to wrap up just by, uh, again, drawing attention to our e-extension learning network, um, unmanned aircraft systems and agriculture. There's a great deal of information available there.